many laws in the Torah that pertain to what are called Tuma and Tara. In other words, ritual purity and impurity. Tara is purity and Tuma is impurity. And those probably are the best translations to English that we could use. Uh, but we really should keep them as Tuma and Tara, impurity and purity, respectively, uh, because we have to learn from the Torah what words mean by the context of their usage in all the cases that are considered where these concepts come up. Because uh, it's not really at all clear. There's no uh, definition or essay or whatever in the Torah about ritual purity means the following. And this is why it matters. You just have to see that the most central and important issue surrounding it is that it, it controls whether you get to have access to places that have greater kiddusha. In particular, if you have a plan to, for example, bring an offering to the temple, you need to bring that offering to the temple in a state of tahara. Uh, and there also are issues with tuma and tahara that relate to similar kinds of things, like the turma, the food, the special food that's set aside for the kohanim, uh, that the kohanim have to eat their turma with tahara, they have to eat the special food that's been given to them, uh, which has this kiddusha in a state of tahara, meaning in a state where they're you know, ritually pure. But the most operative thing is this idea that if you are tame, uh, if you are ritually impure, then you're not going to be able to go and do things in the temple, on Harabait, and, and things that bring you, in some sense, into contact with a more direct experience of Hashem's presence, you're not going to be able to go do those things while you're in a state of Tumah. And that means that you're going to have to go through some other actions that will convert you ritually from a state of Tumah to a state of Tara. Uh, and, and so it really is kind of a stoplight, green light kind of thing for access to uh, the experience of the Shekhinah in the temple, right? Like more directly experiencing the presence of Hashem uh, through the context of the Mikdash. And there are several things, therefore, that we might like to understand about that. We first of all want to understand what exactly Tum'ah is, what is the state of ritual impurity, what is by contrast a state of ritual purity, uh, and why should both of those things you know, the, the sort of diet of those two, the, the conversion from one to the other, why should that control whether or not you could visit the Mikdash? Why does it matter? What is the message that we get from the fact that there is this way you can be which prevents you from going to the Mikdash, and there is a way you can be where you are permitted to go, and why is it that certain factors are going to control that, and what does that have to do with whether or not you should be in the temple or not? Uh, and it should be we said at the outset that, as we'll see in particular examples, the state of being tame or tamea, depending on whether you're male or female, uh, is not something that somehow only happens to people who have done wrong or who are being somehow rejected by Hashem. On the contrary, Tuman Tara are built into everyday life for all people. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and, and perhaps it's not the only example one could bring, but one of the best examples um, uh, we get from the beginning of Parshat Tazriah. <speaking in Hebrew> Uh, so we have, and Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, speak to the people of Israel, saying, if a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. You see, the translation already, we should be saying, she shall be ritually impure seven days, and clean is pretty poor translation. As in the days of her menstruation, shall, shall she be uh, ritually impure. Um, and then it goes on, referring to the first circumcision required for the, the male child. Um, and then we read further down, skip a few verses. 
So if she bears a female child instead of the male child that we just heard about, but if she bears a female child, then she shall be ritually impure two weeks, as in her menstruation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. Okay, so um, we, and, and that 66 days, by the way, is, is matched against for a male child also, the 33 days. We skipped over that part. So we have some an interesting puzzle, first of all, in, the, in these pair of laws. But also, even before we get to that, we're talking about childbirth. We're talking about a, a thing that's uh, a great bracha, a great simcha, something to be cherished, something to be celebrated. It's a good thing. It's a good thing in the eyes of the Torah for Am Yisrael to have the bracha of bringing more uh, Israelites into the world who will serve Hashem according to his Torah. And in that context, that perfectly normal context that's part of the expected life cycle of typical people, and for you know, as, as part of what's good in their life, uh, it's expected that you come into a situation where you're going to be tame, or in this case, tame'a, because we're talking about a woman. And it also references the fact that there's another kind of tum'a that will come uh, more regularly in, in the case of, of women because of menstruation. So the point is, it's the the just the basic biology of being capable of bringing life into this world ends up putting one into a state of of tuma of being ritually impure, and that there's nothing necessarily at the outset uh, that somehow the Torah itself that we should be reading in some kind of criticism of that. It's just saying, okay, there are states that you pass through over time that have to do with the biology of your body. It's not the only thing that affects Tuma and Tara, um, but it's certainly one of them. And that can put you in a state of being able to go to the Mikdash, or it can put you in a state of being unable to go to the Mikdash as the sort of central issue that Tuma and Tara will control. So we're starting to see at least, okay, Tuma is connected with our bodies and uh, certain fixed facts of at least reproductive biology, as it turns out, it's connected with other things as well. Uh, but we still don't really know what it means. Like, why, why is it? We, first of all, don't have any obvious answer to the question, why shouldn't you be able to go to the Mikdash uh, when in such a state? Like, particularly if you were a woman who's given birth to a child, what underlines part of the puzzle here uh, is that even if you started to say, well, maybe there's some issue of, you know, you need to recover from giving birth to a child, and maybe there are things about what is typically happening in the healing of the body of a woman who's just given birth, where somehow we don't want that to collide with the, the situation that we want to have in the Mikdash. So then male child, female child, why... Why this difference of seven days to 14 days or 33 days to 66 days where we have more time uh, that affects the state of Tuma and Tara for a child of one sex than for the other, that flies in the face of the idea that somehow it has to do with like the timing of the woman's physical recovery from giving birth because we don't see enormous differences, uh, you know, twofold differences in some kind of process of physical recuperation, depending on whether you have a male child or a female child. So instead, we should imagine that there's a hint, perhaps, for us in the fact that there is a difference in halakha, a difference in the law about how male and female children are treated in this case, uh, about what Tuma and Tara really mean and why they somehow should uh, connect to our access to the, the Mikdash. Uh, the, the experience of Hashem that we have there. So it's probably too lengthy a discussion to build this up one source after another because there are so many sources about Tuma'atara uh, that 
uh, going through exhaustively all the different things that can make you to you know tame, um, and all the different rituals that convert one from tuma back to tara, uh, and trying to make some theory of it, you know, might be a bit lengthy. So I want to instead give a you know, state a thesis and give a sort of compressed account of the different kinds of places that this information comes from, and then we can look at it in detail in a few sources. So there are two kinds of overlapping or related concepts that I think you might be able to claim cover all cases of Tuma and Tara, even though they're quite diverse, right? If you go through the whole Torah, there are lots of different things that can make you tummy. We mentioned already things to do with the reproductive life cycle of women. There also are things to do with the corresponding anatomy of men related to reproduction and the sort of corresponding uh, gametes, you know, the, the production of the other part of the uh, equation in producing a fertilized embryo um, that have to do with Tuma and Tara, um, and the sort of possible dysfunction of uh, reproductive organs in men or in women, in both cases that can uh, maybe be connected with Tuma and Tara, but it by no means stops there. Seemingly, unrelatedly at first, there's also uh, a clear association between Tuma and death. Uh, so if, for example, you come into contact with a dead body, then you immediately become Tameh. Um, and then there's even this radiating set of other things that can become Tameh, like objects that can become Tameh because of their contact or proximity to uh, a dead body of a person. Um, and then there's further possibility of communication of Tumah via those things, um, depending on the circumstances. And then there's also carcasses of animals, uh, little creepy crawly things, you know, centipedes, mice, whatever, like what would be called a sheretz, like a creeping crawling thing of the earth. Um, also, there's tzara'at, which is going to be, you know, particularly puzzling because it, it isn't an obvious exactly what kind of phenomenon we're really talking about. It's some kind of anomaly in your skin, which can only be identified by the kohen, by the priest. Um, and it will contain for us a hint of what Tumah really is about, because it is a halachic construction within the framework of the Torah, the con in contrast with lots of other things we just mentioned, right? Lots of different uh, things that we just mentioned have objective, universal, obvious meaning to people, like what a mouse is, or uh, what a dead human body is. You don't need to be operating within the framework of Torah to talk about what those things are. In, the, in contrast, Sara'at is something that only has meaning within the context of the Torah. It's not a bacterial infection. It's not skin cancer. It's not something that could have an objective medical definition because only the Kohen can identify it. Um, and yet it is something about the body and about the skin, a sort of manifestation of an anomaly. So it is its own thing that only lives within the framework of Halakha. And we have to... Um, understand it in those terms, but that helps in a, in a sense because we kind of know that it's going to give us a hint of what Tumai is about because everything else you could say, okay, well, other people know what mice are, or other people know what it means for a person to not be alive, and we might easily agree on those things, but if the Torah is inventing, in a sense, the concept for us of Tzarat, and I don't mean inventing meaning as though it's it's a fiction, but more like it's, it's teaching us to relate to certain phenomena of the world that we observe and experience through this halachic framework that only lives within the context of Torah, um, then perhaps the rules that it gives us about that are going to help us to make sense of what the Torah itself thinks about Tumah. Because if you're a mitzvah, if you have this, this anomaly in your skin, then you're tamein. You're also not invited to mikdash. Um, or quite the opposite. You're excluded from it. Um... There are so many different kinds of things that can make one tame that I'm a little worried still that I have left some clear category out. But I think we've covered enough categories that we start to be able to make some kind of 
theory of the case that binds things together. And I think the thing that people usually say that is supposed to um, be sufficient, perhaps, for our our needs um, is that Tumai is about death. Uh, it's about human death. And, and there, you know, you, you can run that thread through almost everything that we've just mentioned. And it kind of makes sense, right? So the obvious one is an actual uh, corpse of a human being, right? And that's the sort of uh, perhaps the, the the center of gravity for a whole bunch of other understanding. Right? Once we know that, then we say, okay, well, what about reproductive biology? Oh, well, there was potential for life and then it failed to live, right? Like there are uh, things about how the body works and, and how either the male or the female body help to produce a new life where if that potential for life doesn't quite uh, make it or else, you know, as part of a separation between a new life and some other part of what was there supporting it and nourishing it, you have something that's kind of like the tissue of a living thing, but now it's dead, like a placenta, for example. Like there are all sorts of things, whether you're talking about um, pre uh, the moment of producing of a fertilized egg, or whether you're talking about after a child has come uh, you know, to term, there are all sorts of things in reproductive biology where we can kind of put it in the category of something that had the potential to be alive but ends up kind of not making it. And so maybe there's some association with that. So it's it's not as strong as an actual, you know, tum'a uh, that you might get from actual encounter with human death, but it evokes that. And then you start to say, okay, what about creepy crawly things? Well, you might find them in a tomb, for example, right? So you associate that they're not actually necessarily coming from anything that has to do with human death, but because your sense of association of them with death is, death is so strong uh, that they would be crawling all over you, so to speak, if you were exhuming a body, you know, and, and had to be involved in that, that um, they become associated and therefore they also have this idea of tuma. And then, you know, the carcass of an animal, you know, we have to be careful with that one because there clearly are uh, completely acceptable ways of having a, a kosher animal that is not alive in the Mikdash, and it's not at all a source of tumah, right? If you slaughter a sheep in the Mikdash, you're doing what you're supposed to do twice a day, and that doesn't produce tumah. So it can't be that it's just the fact that the animal is also dead. It's not animal death. Um, it's instead perhaps the fact that it's a, it's a, it's carrion, you know, it's a carcass you find out in the field. And that starts to be sort of, well, animals have flesh and we have flesh. And when you find an animal carcass in the field, it's a little bit unclear always, you know, what it is. And it, you just have the more sense of like the biological resemblance of it to perhaps a human carcass. And so, you know, it, it again, kind of like with the creepy crawlies, it takes on the resemblance to human death uh, in a way that has to do with its decay and it's, you know, being found lying out in the field, so to speak. And so then we say, okay, now if you touch that, then you're, you're tummy. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it may also have to, to do with the, the subjective perspective of what reminds us uh, of death. So that probably covered everything. Oh, no, it didn't cover Tzarat. So Tzarat, if we didn't know anything else about it, other than that it's this you know, weird anomaly in your skin, you wouldn't necessarily associate it with death. But as we said, the Torah provides us with a lot of detail of how to study what Saran means. For example, uh, both in narrative and in halakha. So in narrative, uh, we have this statement by Aharon Kohen when Miriam is mitzorath. Uh, she becomes uh, afflicted with Tzarath. And um, when Aaron is pleading with Akados Baruch, he says, Alna tehi kemif, asher betzeto mirehem imo, v'yeachel hatsi besaro. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he comes out of his mother's womb. And I'm going to want to 
quibble with that exact translation, but for our purposes at the moment, there's a clear association between Sarat and death in the language of Aaron and Kohen. And he would know, he's the Kohen, he's the one who gets to decide who's Mitzorah. Um, but also, when we, when we look at the, the, the ritual of being, of becoming Tahor, of becoming ritually pure after being Tameh, after being impure from Tzarat, it very closely resembles the, the ritual uh, we use to generate the ash from the red cow, the red heifer, the, the para aduma, that is necessary for achieving tahara, purification, from the tum'ah, from the ritual impurity of death. Uh, so, you know, th there are significant overlaps. There's uh, involvement of ezov, hyssop, and erez, cedar wood, and tol'ah shani, like the, a, a sort of crimson thread. Um, and, and so uh, there also might be reason for us uh, to read connection to death into Sarath on the basis of its uh, halachic resemblance to death insofar as what we need to do to become tahor from it um, is the same. It's, it's not sufficient to just immerse yourself in water. You have to do uh, these more complicated things that resemble each other on specific points. So since the Torah gives us the concept of Sarat, it can tell us that Sarat is about being kind of half dead or something, or like one who is dead. Uh, and we can't really uh, you know, disagree with that because it, it's, it's including that in a sense and part of the definition of, of what Sarat is supposed to be. So I think maybe we've at least covered the examples of Tuma and Tara that I mentioned, and I would audaciously claim that there aren't examples of Tuma and Tara that, um, or it's not easy to find ones, let's say, but maybe there aren't any at all, where it's it's possible um, uh, to, to look at the whole thing and see no connection whatsoever to what you might call uh, an association with human death. And before going on, because I, I will want to argue that only thinking about human death in connection with Tum'ah is insufficient somehow. It doesn't, it doesn't tell the whole story about what Tum'ah really means. But before getting to that, we can see already why, insofar as Tum'ah is about association with human death, it makes sense that Tum'ah is your stoplight saying, don't go to the Mikdash right now for a variety of reasons. First of all, because being associated with human death also associates you, associates you perhaps with mourning, right? And being a mourner, being an avel, is something we don't bring to the Mikdash because the Mikdash is supposed to be a place of simha. It's a place for hagim. It's a place for uh, achieving kapara, atonement for one's sins. It's a place where we go to encounter at Kodosh Baruch Hu and to be overjoyed at the imminence of his presence in the Mikdash. Uh, and going in a state where Simha is inappropriate for you wouldn't make sense. So certainly if someone is a mourner because they've, you know, and they, as a result, they've been recently in contact actually with human death, that would make sense. And then it's a little bit of a stretch to say, well, everything else is sort of a, a tiny sliver of that. And so we still keep it away, but fine, you might say that. But on top of that, I think, also, I think as, as we mentioned in previous Shiorim, it's also about the unique valuation to human life that the Torah wants to give. Remember that the Mikvidash, as we mentioned earlier, is not a place where animals don't die. Lots of animals die in the Mikvidash, according to the Torah and the way it's supposed, things are supposed to run there. Right? You have one sheep in the morning and one sheep in the afternoon, meaning at least you're going to have your olat tamid, so you're going to slaughter two sheep and burn them up on the altar, and that's totally kasher, totally fine, totally the way it's supposed to be, and it doesn't bring tum'ah, or something that is tameh, into the mikdash, but of course, anything to do with uh, a human 
death, you want to keep as far away from there as you can. And one of the things that that does is it strongly delineates uh, a difference between animal life and human life that the Torah wants to affirm, right? It wants to say that, well, there are things about us that may be similar to animals. And indeed, it may to some degree be the case that when certain kinds of korbanot, certain kinds of offerings are being made with animals, that the animal is acting as some kind of substitute for us, like particularly in that korban hatat, right? There you have an offering that's being made for a sin, for a misdeed that you're trying to atone for. And there is an element of, well, I've done wrong. And at some level, you know, when I do wrong, like those Baruch who is kind of checking if I really uh, should be in this world, because I should be in this world to do right and not to do wrong. Um, and so the animal goes in our stead to the slaughter, and it reminds us, um, of our mortality and reminds us that we stand before our king and our judge and all of that. So um, there is some sense of, of resemblance, right? You know, you can't make a korban hatat with a watermelon or something. It has to be with an animal that you know, has blood, like you have blood. Uh, but on the other hand, what the Torah is saying to us is the gulf between the value of human life and the value of animal life is unbridgeable. It's the biggest difference you could imagine because the same place that is almost like a slaughterhouse for animals in terms of particularly, you know, on Sukkot or something, you just have enormous numbers of animals that have to be slaughtered and roasted and cut into pieces. I guess not in that order, but you get the idea. Um, and then at the same time, we're going to the nth degree, not just to say don't bring dead human bodies to this place, but don't bring a person who's just been with one. And... Also, you know, anyone who's happened to touch, you know, a creepy crawly thing that reminds you of being in a crypt or something, that also is going to, you know, make that person tame and then they can't come. So it's it's all these, these sort of rings of um, exclusion that are not even directly about human death, but are about these things associated with it. And it's to show how enormous the differences between human life and non, and you know and animal life in the eyes of the Torah that human death does not belong in the house of Elohim Chaim, right? The living God who wants to come or what wants us to come there so that we can encounter his presence in a particular way so that we can relive the experience of revelation in Haram Sinai, so that we can do all the things that we're supposed to do with the Mishkan and the Mikdash that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. In that state, he absolutely refuses to admit even the slightest hint of human death, because it's about Simha, it's about rejoicing, and it's about Chaim, it's about life. Uh, but in that same context, plenty of animals meet their end. Uh, and that's showing us that in the eyes of the Torah, in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, human life is unique and different uh, and, and should not be ever put remotely on some kind of uh, plane of equality with animal life. But then there's the question of why, you know, and, and that points to what I referred to before, that we haven't fully examined Tum'an Tahara yet to see what else they might mean. And that might also answer the question of, well, what is so special about human life then? Like, if we aren't just animals, if we, if our blood being spilled is so qualitatively different than that of a sheep's blood being spilled in the same place, on what basis is that determination being made, right? Of course, you could do it arbitrarily, but those Baruch is not going to give us all these laws to make an arbitrary distinction and say, we've decided that we want you to be treated very differently, it's going to be on the basis of our characteristics. Right? As he created us and the sheep, etc., he gave us differing characteristics and, and then correlated those characteristics with this huge difference in what the Torah um, uh, commands with re regarding life and death in, in each of those cases. So now we, we go back to Tuman Tara and see if there's more to understand. And there we may get a hint from this puzzle we started off with, which is in Parshat Tazria, because we're asking the question, why would it be the case 
that if a woman gives birth to a male child, that there's a seven-day period of waiting. And for a female child, there's a 14-day period of waiting uh, that has to do somehow with Tuma Tara, uh, associated with the life cycle of her body recovering from delivery. If it's the case that it's just about physical recovery, as we said, it doesn't really make sense uh, that you know, male and female children, or you know, uh, would, would have such a, a huge difference or a twofold difference. So, if it isn't about that, then what is it about? And here, I want to put forward the other part of uh, the theory of the case here, which is that Tuman Tara, as much as they are about uh, getting the Mikudash as far away from human death as possible, that is a completely legitimate reading of Tuman Tara. It is also the case that all the instances we know of of Tuma and Tara are explained by the idea of mixed up identity, meaning uh, that there's a there's a way of being whole in oneself uh, with a clear, separate, uh, and pure singular identity of an individual, and then there's a sense of some kind of alloyedness, some kind of intermixedness of your identity with the identity of someone or something else, particularly some someone else. Uh, and that mixed upness uh, is, is, I mean, it, it's funny because once you state that, you say, oh, that's pretty straightforward from what uh, the Torah is actually telling us because what it says is, Ahor means pure, right? So if you have achieved a state of tahara, we call it ritual purity, it's not just sort of an arbitrary word that just means some kind of version of good. And so we pick pure because people like pure things for some reason. It's a very literal description of something, right? Zahav ahor means pure gold in the language of the Torah. So if you're making something out of gold, and the Torah says pure gold, it means just gold. And when it comes to metallic elements, we know what that means, right? You can mix, you can alloy different elements together. You make something that has some gold in it, but also has some silver in it, also has some copper in it. But that's not going to fly if the Torah says taho, right? If it says pure. So then the question is, when it's talking about me or a human being, what does it mean for me to be tahor, that I am purely myself? How can I be something other than that? What are the contexts in which I could be that? Um, and uh, so we, we already are getting kind of a hint from the word tahor itself, but on that basis, without the halachot, without the actual laws that the Torah teaches us, we wouldn't really know how to implement that, right? I, I can only go to the Mikdash if I'm tahor, if I'm pure in myself, and not if I feel impure. Does that mean, like, I have some mud on me? No, it doesn't, right? Because mud doesn't make you tameh. Mud makes you dirty. Uh, but, you know, that is not the same thing as being tameh. Um, and there are lots of things like that that you could imagine where they might make give you some sense of I'm somehow, uh, according to some theory of things, less pure, but I'm Actually not, less tahor, and I can't go to the mikdash. So we need the laws. We need to study the details of the laws to understand what it really means. But it clearly intends to mean partly that, that tumah is the opposite of tahara. So if you are tahor, you are pure in yourself. And if you are tameh, you've somehow not just become blocked arbitrarily from going to the mikdash, and we call that impure because it's kind of supposed to sound a little insulting. It's that you somehow become mixed up with something else. You are not as purely yourself as you were when you were Tahor. And you need some way of getting back there. So what are some examples uh, that now show us from the Alachot of the Torah that the Torah agrees with this idea and even illustrates for us a little bit more what it means in what way we can become not Tahor uh, when we are Tame'im. So the the... Um, example I, I first want to talk about is in Sefer Waikra, um, and it's Perek Yud Gimel, Pasuk Yud Gimel, 
right? So um, this is in the middle of talking about all these different laws of tzara'at, um, all these different laws of this uh, anomaly in the skin. So it says, Ura'a ha-kohen, wahine, chista ha-tzara'at et kol b'saro, wotihar et ha-naga'a, kulo hafah lavan tahor hu. All right, so then the priest shall consider, and behold, if the tzara'at has covered all the flesh of the person who is a mitzvah, he shall pronounce him who has this affliction, uh, then it, since it is all turned white, he is clean, you know, he is tahor, he is pure. Um, so we're talking about a case where someone has had tzara'at, but the tzara'at spreads, and it spreads to cover all of the skin of the person, right? So it starts off, it's, it's just localized, and let's say the priest looks and he says, oh, it's tzara'at, but then it keeps growing and spreading, and this new character of organization and presentation in the skin spreads until it covers the whole body. Not a mitzvah anymore. You're not. You're not. You, you no longer have tzara'at, even though tzara'at was seemingly the thing that was spreading across your skin. Now that it covers all of your skin, uh, it, it's no longer called tzara'at. So that is quite a puzzle if you relate to tzara'at as though it's something like skin cancer, right? Where you say, well, there's the healthy, normal skin, and then there's the skin that is somehow organizing differently. You know, it's going to harm your body. It has to do with a different biological state of cell growth. And obviously, if someone had a skin cancer that somehow spread to cover their whole body, they wouldn't then be fine. You wouldn't say, okay, good. Your skin's all the same thing now, so you're fine again. Because the presumption is, I mean, well before that, it would be harming your body in a variety of ways. So tzara'at, in contrast, clearly by definition now is something that has to do with the incoherence of the skin. You know, one part with another part, right? The mixedness of it, the impurity literally of the character of presentation of the skin of the person who has it. That if they're half one thing and half another thing, then they are mitzora. But if they're one of those things and not the other thing, it doesn't matter which one they are, then they're not a mitzvah. So that's like a, a relatively clear example that really this is about being tahor or not tahor. And in this instance, it's about something that's visible in your physical body, whether you are pure or mixed up. So tzarat really kind of pushes to the fore this idea of mixed upness as can be assessed in this case, visually, by just looking at, at someone's skin. But obviously not all Tuma and Tara are about your skin. That's the specific aspect of Tara that we're dealing with here. So it helps us to understand that this is about some sense of being mixed up, but it's not always going to be um, about the same kind of mixed upness. I will say, though, in this Pasuk we read before about Aharon, right? Aharon was pleading for... Miriam's tzara to go away, he says to Akadosh Baruch again, Al na tehi kamef asher b'tzeto merehem imo wayeachel hatsi b'saro. So I want to translate it differently now. Let her not be like one who is dead. And then it says, asher b'tzeto merehem imo. And you, it sounds like we're, it's talking about one who emerges dead from his mother's womb. So it's like a stillborn child. And then it's some kind of characterization of what it's like when a stillborn child comes out. And um, we have uh, Aaron saying, and half his flesh is eaten. Which I think, since it's you know in narrative and it's someone's kind of attempt at describing something, you don't really stop and think, well, is it really the case that whenever a child is stillborn that you know, it's somehow it's half his flesh is eaten, or maybe he's only talking about a certain kind of set of cases of stillbirth. But really, you could also read it as, So if you stop it at Kamev, what it's saying is, let her not be like one that is dead. Um, that one who emerges from his mother's womb 
half his flesh is eaten, and that there is a sense of death always associated with emergence from his mother's womb. So we're not necessarily talking about a stillbirth. We're just talking about when a child is born, half the flesh is consumed. Now, what is that referring to? Well, biologically, it could be referring, for example, to the placenta, right? There is actually a very developed uh, and complex shared piece of tissue surrounding the, the uh, gestating fetus that although it's from the uh, developing fetus, it also much more intermixes in terms of uh, what are called mosaic cells that have mixed biology between the mother and child. And, you know, it's a very mixed up thing. Um, and not only that, though, it's, it's, it's when the child is inside the mother, it's very hard in a sense to say, well, this is where the fetus stops and the placenta begins and the placenta is just sort of a balloon that the, the fetus is living in. On the contrary, it's like one living thing uh, and you can't really separate them, right? And there is this very ambiguous boundary between the body of the mother and the body of the, of the growing child inside the mother. And at some point, there's going to have to be a rupture in that boundary, and you're going to have a child and a mother. And the placenta was mediating that gray area in between. And that is the thing uh, that, among other things, is going to die, right? The placenta doesn't live after the child is separated from it. But in a sense, it was like the flesh of the child, and yet also was sort of like the flesh of the mother. So you have this instance of a thing that is sort of like a living human being, but not really, uh, but it's living human biology, and it has ambiguous identity, um, and it's going to be consumed or destroyed or, or degraded uh, once the child is born. Interestingly, in modern Hebrew, at least, um, and I have not had a chance to check how far back this goes, the word for, for placenta is shilia. Uh, and what's interesting about that is that it's a very clear blend between sheli and shela, right? So it's partly mine, it's partly hers, meaning you're talking about your placenta, it's partly you, and it's also partly your mother. Um, so it's, you know, a, a, a almost, you know, a humorously cute uh, blending of two concepts. Um, uh, and the more, you know, we could find a source for that going back to, let's say, I don't know, or something, then you could even start to perhaps invest that with some authority and say, oh, maybe Chazan are making the point that we've been just trying to make about the placenta, but I haven't gotten to investigate uh, who coined the term. So if it was Eliezer ben Yehuda, then you know, we just have to give him credit for uh, being clever. Um, so in any case, we've made this point about the placenta um, and this this expression of ironic events that really also, in addition to evoking death, also evokes mixed upness and ambiguous identity or sort of mixed together human identities. And now that we've thought about that a bit, we start to realize before even considering other cases, this is going to be a fairly good explanation for why you would have to wait different amounts of time before a mother who's given birth to a child can go to the Mikdash, depending on whether the child is male or female, because the mother is always female, right? And when the son is born, she separates from the child that was in her womb and they become two different people. When the daughter is born, the same thing happens. But the mother in biology and in many other respects as well, will resemble her daughter more, right? There's some fundamental sense in which the daughter and the mother are more alike because they're both female. And therefore, you might imagine the separation required to stop being mixed up is going to be more difficult in that case, right? That it's, it's going to be the sooner the case that a male child can kind of have a separate identity from his mother, having shared a body with her, than for a female child. And so the Torah is reflecting the similarity, the greater similarity in fundamental biological respects of one child um, to the mother than another. So you have to wait a bit longer, you know, twice as long, in fact, 
Um, and I don't have an as easy a time finding an explanation for that difference in Alakha if we just are looking for things based on some theory of this is all about human death and we have to get away from human death. Uh, you might be able to come up with a parallel theory, uh, and, and, but I, I, I think that the mixed upness maybe is a stronger theme in, in that particular example. And then, you know, we can take mixed upness and consider other cases. We talked about, you know, carcasses of animals. We talked about creepy crawlies. Uh, and, and for that matter, if we're not going to use the idea that human death is the problem, we also need an explanation for what the problem with being in the presence of human death is. But I think that those all kind of roll together in the following way, that being in the presence of human death becomes a case of how mixed upness is a problem. Why? Because we can't avoid having the sense that once we're in the presence, not of another person, but in the presence of another person who no longer is alive and now their body is going to start to fall apart. And, you know, obviously not rapidly, but we're conscious of the fact that they're, you know, you're returning to dust. That something that was alive is now going to turn into something that it can be more kind of dispersed in the environment. And also, obviously, the breath of life is something we, we immediately sense kind of leaves the body and, and perhaps permeates uh, the environment uh, of uh, the body that it left. And so we have some sense of there was a boundary between me and you, but if you, Hasbah Khalila, died, then now suddenly, psychologically at the very least, and maybe even physically to some degree, if you know there's kind of a greater degree of transfer of physical material depending on obviously how much a body is decomposed. Like you can get, you become tame by finding a hundred year old human skull, right? And there, of course, there's actual transfer of physical material because it really has decomposed a lot. So there's this sense of now there's something that was part of someone else and now it's on me or it's mixed up with me in ways I haven't really controlled very well. I need some way of separating myself from that mixed upness. And once you talk about all the sheritzes, all the creepy crawly things, you know, everything to do with human death that we, we said before is associated with human death, like that you find in a crypt or something like an animal carcass or whatever, um, it starts to, you know, be part of the same explanation. It's about this feeling of it's crawling all over me and it's, it's, it's mixing up with me and also maybe mixing me up with um, particulate human death that is associated with it. Um, and, and so it is, it is just about a sense of I'm no longer pure in myself. I am mixed up in ways I can't control, possibly physically, possibly otherwise, with some sense of the presence of another life. And that can be about a crypt, so to speak, and uh, it can be about uh, a human cadaver, but it can also be about uh, things that are less directly associated with death, although we can make a case here and there, but have to do with the sort of the formation of new identity, right? Because when childbirth is happening, you have new identity coming into being. And there's this moment where uh, you have a child and a mother and a second ago they were one body and now they aren't. Uh, and it has to be acknowledged somehow that it takes time for that development of separate unmixed upnesses uh, to take place. And the last point I think that we want to now bring in is tevila, the, the immersion in maim haimim, you know, the immersion in uh, water that is suitable as a mikwe, is suitable as a pool for ritual immersion. That, generally speaking, is how you stop being tame. You may need other things, right? If you were in the presence of a human cadaver, you need the ashes that come from para aduma, from the red heifer, but there always is this element of tevila, of, of immersion uh, in water. And of course, now the question is what kind of water, right? Um, you, it has to be either rainwater that's collected in a uh, pool that is not 
you know, a transportable container that you've caught it in and you've like lugged the water around. So, or, or it could be, you know, river, or it could be a, well, I mean, this, we get into details about it, but it could be, uh, so it may be that it's, it's not normally suitable to do it exactly in a river, so to speak, but it, if you're going to do it in a pond, it can't be a pond that is disconnected um, from other sources of water unless, you know, the whole thing is, you know, being fed by rainwater uh, in, in the right way. Like it's, 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 it needs to be either that it's being fed by water, you know, bodies of water that connect to the ocean somehow, or it's being fed um, by springs that come up from the ground, or it's being fed by the rain. It's, it's about connecting you to the kind of global water supply. Like the word Mikwe appears first in Ma'ase Bereshi when we're hearing about the creation of the world. Uh, and that contrasts with water that, you know, you collected in a bucket and you lugged the bucket around and you used the bucket to fill a pool, et cetera. It's not water that's become a kind of separate tool in your hand. It's water that somehow still has its living connection to the, the hydrological cycle of the planet uh, and to the vast reservoirs of water in the oceans. Um, and those miklaos, those um, pools of water, like HaKadosh Baruch Hu used when he created the world. And so what it's evoking is that ultimately, if you're going to uh, get away from human death and get away from mixed up identity, in either case, you need to be reborn, you need to be recreated, you need to have some sense of connecting yourself with the beginning of the world and taking on uh, a kind of newly created uh, status uh, by emerging from that water. And you know, obviously, this is something that Halakha gives us as a means to achieve Tahara. So it's, it's ultimately about rules. It's not about, you know, in, in, invented emanations of, of mystical, ghostly things happening in an invisible world that we don't see. It's about a structure of rules from which we can learn meaning that Agathos Baruch Hu wants us to be sensitive to. And so he needs to give us a means to become Tahor. Uh, and, and therefore, he gives us a means that reminds us about the idea of rebirth. So we don't need to make up some notion of we actually are reborn in some magical, mystical way we can't see, or we actually are recreated. And it removes the demonic spirits that are attaching to us because of impurity. All of that stuff is nowhere in the Torah um, and uh, is, you know, to, to the degree that you hear it, it comes much later. It comes because of the hunger people have to invent the kind of pseudoscience behind what they're doing because they're looking for reasons and they're not looking for them in the right place. The place you want to be looking for them is in the framework of meaning that the rules actually provide for you about what this should mean by just seeing things like, oh, if the tzarat spreads to cover the whole body, it's not tzarat anymore. So that must mean this is all about my being mixed up, right? And then it's like, well, if you feel somehow mixed up and not whole in yourself, then how are you supposed to fix that? You know, what means could Akadosh Baruch Hu give you uh, to, to repair that? And it turns out, what the mikwa or, or, or what the mikwa or the, the the these pools for immersion are accomplishing is that they are connecting you with the concept of the recreation of the world uh, and the separation of waters, you know, and and all the different uh, sources of water that are part of the living whole of the planet, um, and, and that you have to kind of emerge from as though you're part of the, the recreation of the world. So uh, I, I want to say this on the side because I, I missed it before. There's another great example about this mixed upness, um, which comes also from the ritual of how you become no longer mitzvah. Uh, and, and that is that you have these two birds, and one of the birds is shechted into a clay bowl, it's slaughtered into a clay bowl, and its blood is collected, and then the other bird gets dunked in the blood of the first bird, and then you let that bird go, right? So what a what a vivid image of we had these two different living things and one of them has been marked with the blood of the other thing and then it flew away. And it's showing you 
in kind of a pictorial presentation, this idea of mixed upness of two different living things that had separate identities. And now the identity of one has been uh, imprinted onto the other and, and that other one went away. And it's also associated with the, with the identity of that which has died. Um, so it is perfectly paralleling both the concept of mixed up identity and the concept of death. Um, and showing it to us in, in you know, a very uh, specific presentation. So now we have to just ask ourselves to close this up. What do we make of all of it? I mean, you know, everything that we've said, if, if you buy it, just to review, it's that Tuma and Tahara are about, are they, they are much more literally about some idea of purity than we might realize. They're about the notion of are you whole in yourself and your unique identity? Or are you somehow mixed up with the identity of another person, perhaps mixed up with the death of another person? But, you know, it, it can also be just like we focus on the mixed upness. And indeed, there's some other mentions of Tum'a and the Torah that confirm that, uh, because sometimes Tum'a is associated, for example, with adultery in a way that seems unnecessary. You could just say, Lot enough, don't commit adultery. But then there are these other psukim that say, you know, someone is somehow causing impurity through the act of adultery. And the question is what that means. But obviously, when men and women get together in that way, there is a sense of the unification of identity. Obviously, it can produce children, right? So that certainly uh, is a unification of identity. But well before that, you have people who encounter each other and come away, obviously, with some sense of uh, the identity of the other person has become uh, intermixed with theirs to some degree. Uh, and, and so the, 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 I, I think we have many proof texts for the idea of Tuma being connected with intermixedness. Uh, and we are forbidden from going to the Mikdash when we are in that state. Uh, either, you know, we already talked about why it's important to get human death away from the Mikdash, so we'll assume that's, that issue is dealt with. But if we look at it on the, on the, so, solely on the terms of Tum'a on the, on the, on the, on, uh, as being about mixed upness, what is the problem with mixed upness as far as that to those Baruch is concerned? Why, why is it a problem to go to the Mikdash if you're all mixed up? If you're half yourself and half your recently born child? Or if you are half yourself and half your spouse, or half yourself and half some strange other self that's spreading across your skin. You know, all the different things that somehow bring bring about Tum'ah, according to the Torah. What could, uh, and it doesn't even have to be half, obviously, but it can be, you know, not, you're not whole in yourself. Why is that a problem uh, in, in how we uh, relate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? I think in the end, the point is, this is meant to be an additional message for us to understand something about what Hashem wants from us when we come to Him in the Mikdash. That uh, there is a way that He wants to have us feel about ourselves in the moment when we experience our encounter with him, and it has to do with uh, a sense of completeness and wholeness, a sense of knowing that we're not coming there, bringing anything other than our own selves to him, to have the sense of greater encounter and to have the sense of awe, beholding the Shekhinah, beholding the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in this house that we built for him. Uh, and that that reminds us that this is not something that we are doing that uh, we can do properly and correctly, independent of our psychological state, right? That if we come to the Mikdash and we just say, okay, well, there's a bunch of rituals you can do here. I'll go and, you know, I'll eat some or I'll go and I'll I'll bring this sheep there because I did something wrong. 
I'll in this perfunctory way perform, you know, I'll, I'll participate in certain actions that you can participate in there. You're going to miss the point if you're not keeping track of what's going on in terms of your understanding of who you are and who therefore is seeking some kind of a greater sense of encounter with the world's creator. So the Torah is very uh, focused on things we do in the external world and in this world, in the, you know, in the here and now. So it's about Olam Abba, I mean, it's about Olam Azeh instead of Olam Abba. And it's also about how do I show things through action? Give me mitzvot to do. So what we've just been talking about is mitzvot, commandments, things you can do, things you can refrain from doing in certain circumstances, things you can do to get from a state where you have to refrain to a state where you can participate. And, and the point is that's because you can't legislate about psychology. You can't uh, easily create a, a complex framework of laws saying you really need to be in the right headspace in order to receive uh, the presence of the world's creator or to encounter it and, and to, to get something out of that that he wants you to get out of that. How would you begin to legislate that in a way that people could learn from? And the answer is, you don't legislate about that. You legislate about all of these things that govern our relationships with other people, our relationships with our own body, uh, our relationship with uh, other kinds of living things and bodies of living things and all of these things that do reflect back on as it turns out, our own mental state and our sense of wholeness in ourself. Uh, and, and the point is that that's the beginning of showing you how to develop the proper mindset for seeking more intimate relationship with Echadosh Baruch Hu through the Mikdash that he's commanded us to build. So I wouldn't say that it's sufficient even simply to say, okay, I'm tahor, I'm all good. I, I, I did all, I checked all the boxes. I got my ashes uh, and, and performed, you know, this or that ritual of tahara, and now I'm tahara, and now I can go to the mikdash and check out and, and not really, you know, concern myself about my mental state. On the contrary, I think the point is all of this should be thought of as a stepping stone. It's like the first step in refining our state of consciousness so that we can have the proper reaction to and the proper experience from the encounter with our creator that we're supposed to have when we go to the Mikdash. Uh, and by studying all the details of these laws of Tumah and Tara, we may begin uh, to better prepare ourselves uh, for having the greatest success of encounter and relationship with Akados Baruch Hu, uh, that we can when we have a mikdash to go and visit an Arabian in Yerushalayim.